Welcome to the She's Bold podcast. I'm Beth Whitman. Hi, folks. Welcome back to another episode of the She's Bold podcast. This is where you'll hear one-on-one conversations with women who have inspirational stories to share. I know I make it harder on myself by making these in person, but I think there's really something to be said for the dynamics and rapport that happens face to face that I personally don't think I could get over a phone or a Skype call. Now, I'm always on the lookout for guests here in the Pacific Northwest where I live, but I also do travel a lot. So if you have suggestions, send me a note at beth at she's bold podcast.com, or if you know someone, just send her my way. As you may know, my guests are women who are breaking new ground in their fields, who are changing their stories, their negative self-talk, and are overcoming their doubts to pursue what they love, perhaps things that they thought they could never do. Bottom line is that they have inspirational stories to share, and I know you'll learn something from every one of these conversations. I do, at least. If you like what you hear, do me a solid and make sure you're subscribed and then share the podcast with a few friends whom you think might also be inspired by these conversations. And if you really enjoy the show and have some spare change, you can support this ad-free show by going to patreon.com slash be bold. Patreon supporters help me bring these conversations to you and do so by becoming a patron for just five bucks a month. That is a chocolate bar a month. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus audio content, have the ability to submit questions for me to ask guests, and ladies are invited to become part of a private Facebook group. Okay, with that, today's guest is Sarah Tuttle. Sarah teaches introductory astronomy and observational astrophysics at the University of Washington. You'll hear how and why I was so eager to chat with Sarah at the beginning of our conversation. And then as you hear her talk about not only her work, but about her activism, you'll understand why she is such a great fit for the podcast. In this conversation, we talk about how she got into astronomy, which she describes as a pretty circuitous route. And I think one of the key takeaways from this episode is that sometimes the path to our passion is not always direct. We also talk a lot about her social activism and her goal to bring more diversity into the field of astronomy. I'll tell you, she really left me thinking a lot about how I can make this world a better, more inclusive place. With that, please enjoy this conversation with Sarah Tuttle. So this is really crazy. A friend gave me a copy of Neil deGrasse Tyson's book, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with it? Uh, I haven't read it. Okay. (laughs) Nor should you need to. (laughs) But I started reading this book and I thought, I have no idea what he's talking about. Just don't have a clue. And I read a couple of paragraphs to John, my husband, and he said, yeah, he's a little flowery. I could see how you may not know. But what that did for me is that every time he mentioned something that I didn't understand, I would go look it up. And so I just like, okay, I've got, you know, a search engine, I'm going to go look up at Wikipedia, or, you know, just do a search and, and educate myself here. And then that like cracked something open for me. And I was like, Oh, my God, then I started going to my friend saying, Did you know, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> like, what are you, an idiot? And um, I'm not even going to tell you. They were keeping secrets. You didn't know. They were. You know what? 95% of the population was keeping sec- secrets that <laughs> I didn't know because I'm sure everybody else knows these things. And I am just like, whoa, like, oh my God, I feel like a 12 year old boy. <laughs> Like, so in this conversation, just treat me like a 12 year old boy, if you're talking about any astronomy. And, uh, and that's the level where I am. But anyway, so what that did for me is I put that book aside, and I got astronomy for dummies. Mm -hmm. And so I figured at least that is going to give me really from the basics. And I have been reading that and again, still looking up stuff, you know, because I'm like, okay, what, what exactly does that mean? What does that word mean? But it's, it's gotten so crazy that for Christmas, John actually gave me a trip for, uh, to the uh, Golden Dale mm-hmm. Observatory here in, in Washington State. So coming up sometime this spring, when we know it's going to be clear out, we're going to go take a, oh, take a little weekend trip 
for that. So yeah, it's um, it's really kind of interesting. And so then I was thinking, you know, who's kind of doing what? What women are doing astronomy things <laughs> in the <laughs> Seattle area? And somehow I came upon you. Are you? Are you listed on like the NASA site or on some website as a as a resource? I, I'm sprinkled across the web. It's possible. Okay, it's possible. Yeah, I think I think that might have been where it was. So then, as I as I was kind of looking at your Twitter feed and and some of the writings that you did, I was like, wow, uh, this is a really interesting person because you're not just uh, head down in a laboratory and uh, or looking out at the sky, you are really you're voicing a lot of opinions about mm-hmm. things. And I that's what really got me because I thought this is different. This is a different person. I want to talk to her. So w- we'll get to that stuff. But I just Thanks. wanted to give you that background and also say, go easy on me. <laughs> <laughs> so so what do you think? Why was this the time for you? Why do you think this sparked your interest so much now? You know, why did it spark my interest now? I think that I think I slept my way. I didn't sleep with people. I slept through my, (laughs) let me rephrase that. I think that I slept through my astronomy classes Mm -hmm. in college. And I'm sure I'd slept through some other classes too, but that one was very specific because it was in a, it was a huge room. Mm -hmm. And I remember that the professor gave you a lot of credit for signing in and being there every day. Oh, geez, yeah. So I would go and I was there every day and I passed. I probably got a B in it, but I I obviously did not retain anything <laughs> or I'm, I'm sure he wasn't. Is, we should figure out who that is. We can send them an email. Yeah, he okay. wasn't. He wasn't interesting enough, I think, to hold my attention because I know that things have changed. And I, I, I think I was reading it, even in, on the UW, the professor list, there was somebody who specialized in teaching to bigger groups and mm-hmm. making it very mm-hmm. interactive and very interesting. So I think I think that somehow my awareness of the world, like I've been traveling all over the world, mm-hmm. right? But I don't, I and I, uh, yeah, billions of years, I kind of understand that. Millions of years, I kind of understand that. But there was just something that captured me. And I think I was a little bummed that I was so ignorant of this stuff. So I'm, I have yeah. this book that's supposed to be an easy guide and I don't understand anything. And that's that was a little bit of a bummer for mm-hmm. me. So the universe can be a little humbling. It's a little intense to sort of run into that. Well, it is. And it's it's humbling in the absolute best way. Mm-hmm. Because I just want to shake everybody and say, like, <laughs> do you know how special it is that we're here? Like I said, I feel like a 12 year old boy, like e- evangelical that- astronomer. <laughs> yes, right now I am who knows, you know, in a few months, what will happen. But that's where I am right now. So I think that's what happened to answer your question. Just to set the stage here, you are an assistant professor at the UW. Is that specifically in astronomy? In astronomy or is there okay in the astronomy so, department. So in astronomy. And then what classes do you teach? I teach kind of at all of our levels. I teach introductory astronomy to mostly pre-science and pre-engineering majors. So usually in their first or second years. And I teach uh, observational astrophysics to both our undergraduates and our graduate students. And so that's more hands-on working with data understanding how we do observational astronomy. Um, So what kind of background would a person need to come and sit in your class and kind of understand what's going on? Yeah, students, in my intro class, I frequently have students audit from the community. I was just going to ask, can I come audit? You can always come audit. (laughs) There's one half sheet of paper, I think, that needs signing. Okay. Uh, Yeah, and so, you know, we've had people, some people who have, say, you know, finished their main career and are looking to come back, just looking to get engaged with something they didn't know about before. And so I would say frequently people audit and come and sit in, certainly for the upper division classes, usually familiarity with most of them are dual majors in physics and astronomy. So there's math and physics that we're using pretty regularly and some usually basic coding skills these days in Python because it's kind of it's kind of the the language that is being used across the field more frequently. Python. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Oh, sorry, the programming language Python. Okay. Um, there are no snakes in my class. Oh, yeah, yeah. That would so, make it more exciting. So literally on a computer, the program is called Python. and Yeah, mm-hmm. and so, so most of... A a great deal of work, really, for many years, um, but more and more all the time. A lot of astronomy is done by computer, even if you're at a computer near a telescope, or or if your data is coming from space or from an you know an antenna that you're not visiting. Um, So all of our data processing is happening through computer programming. And how much time are you spent uh, spending in the classroom teaching? 
So I only teach three classes. Um, a and that's No, I, only one a quarter. Oh, okay. Yeah. What do you do with the rest of your time? <laughs> answer emails um so (laughs) you're an email engineer i'm an email engineer i'm excellent at not prioritizing my email well uh so i run a lab so so most most a a big chunk of my time is research research oriented at the uw at the uw so i have a lab um we are working on several big projects we have a big project called sloan five so the sloan digital sky survey has been going on for about 20 years and runs initially ran off a telescope in New Mexico at a site that I work at frequently now has two sites has a site in New Mexico and one uh, at Las Campanas Observatory in Chile and the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in many ways has revolutionized how we do astronomy it it began by taking pictures of the sky in an interesting way in different colors and so the difference with how we used to, and still sometimes do astronomy, was instead of saying, I really care about this star or this galaxy, and I'm going to point a telescope at it and measure it, the Sloan approach was, there's lots of interesting things in the sky. Let's take lots of pictures of the sky and then go and see what we found. So this is the idea of a blind survey, where you're doing a survey, but you're not picking an object that you know about ahead of time. And part of this comes to technical, the hardware improvements allowed us to do that. Sure. And co- the computer processing, both power and expertise has grown over time. So we have tools that allow us to look at big chunks of data and say, where are the interesting things? Or I know this is what a star looks like. Can I find more of them in this big chunk of sky? Uh, and so the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has been running with different experiments, different instruments, or different ways of measuring the light, and has evolved over time. So now I'm involved with a part of the survey where we are installing fiber robots. So instead of the light just falling and making a picture, that light that would have made a picture gets fed through a fiber optic, and that gets recorded. And so we keep track of that. So the the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey evolved from taking pictures to taking something called spectra. So that's the idea of taking light and breaking it into the rainbow, so all of its constituent parts. Um, And now we're going to use these fiber robots to pick very particular objects that we do know about, but we can do between 300 and 500 of them at a time from the telescope in each hemisphere. And that's being used, there are two big projects that are using that. One called the Black Hole Mapper that is mapping black hole evolution. So how black holes are behaving in galaxies. It turns out many galaxies, most galaxies actually, and our galaxy, uh, have black holes at the center. So understanding how black holes and galaxies evolve. And a project called the Milky Way Mapper, which is studying a huge number of stars in the optical and the infrared in our galaxy. So we're really trying to make, in some sense, a very local map, because mapping the billions of stars in our galaxy is hard, and it's the closest thing we have to understand how galaxies evolve and change, and kind of how stars and galaxies are connected. So those, that's we're working on that project in my lab. And then I build instruments for a telescope called the um, Apache Point Observatory ARC, three and a half meter. So there we're also working on two spectrographs of these instruments that take light from objects and split them into rainbows. So we're working on two spectrographs there. And those instruments are a little bit different. Instead of surveys, where we just take lots of data and then make it available to scientists, individual scientists come and propose an idea. So they say, I, you know, I want to study the way that these stars are evolving, or this star is undergoing a, an explosion or an outburst. I want to go study it. I want to know how this galaxy rotates or what you know the metals are. And depending on their institution, they get together a committee that picks the projects they want to work on that quarter. And then they go and either remotely, so you can actually, it's sort of weird, you can sit at your laptop in your house and run the telescope. <laughs> you, know, you used to always have to go up the mountain, sure. which is quite a journey. I still really like going up the mountain, but it turns out you can just like watch Netflix and run the telescope at the same time, uh, which is a whole nother mm-hmm. thing. And so if your project gets picked, you get told when they're going to try and observe your stuff. And you, you operate the telescope with an observer who's there in New Mexico. And you get the data of the thing that you're trying to study. And wow. so we also build things for that. So I work with a group of engineers and technicians, and that's what we do there. So is it common to have, like, it seems to me that the staff, 
the UW staff is rather large. Like I think I counted it's maybe a huge university. <laughs> yeah, but is that so? Is that common to have so many people within one department? You have like twenty or so a faculty members. Yeah, yeah. So our department's actually not that big. I mean, you're right. It has about 20 faculty members, but we're kind of a, a small to medium sized department. So even the physics department has many, many more faculty. It's a much larger department than ours. Astronomy, in some de- in some universities, astronomy and physics are actually the same department. Um, and astronomy is like a subunit of physics. So, you know, I would say that, that our department is medium sized. We do have several large projects. So for example, LSST, which has now recently, excitingly, been renamed the Vera Rubin Observatory. It is an extension of this idea of these survey telescopes of taking pictures of the sky. And that observatory is going to do a very cool thing where it will take images of the whole sky regularly and be able to see changes. Right. So you mentioned to me, you know, seeing a meteor streak by. It turns out a lot of the universe is changing on interesting timescales as short as hours or days. And so LSST will allow us to really study what we call the transient sky. So study the way that that change happens on, sh- on short and also long, but especially on short time scales, um, which is exciting. So we have a lot of uh, research scientists and other technical staff associated with projects like that. And I would say at a university like UW, that's pretty common. Um, and so, and the kind of work that I do requires somewhere that, you know, so sometimes you might find astronomers in pretty small groups because they might just need their computer to be able to access the data they need, or they might be theorists who even just need you know pencils and paper. But when we do big hardware stuff, for example, our, our department has a machine shop in our basement with a, a significantly sized staff of machinists. And so that means that we can get metal cut really close by, or my te- technician can go and use the machines to cut metal. So having access to those resources usually requires a bigger university to support it. So th- you have machinists kind of on call to create metal for... I wish they were on call. They, well. they keep busy with lots of other things, much to my, <laughs> well, much you have, to my disappointment. So you have yeah, access great, to them. That's right. I mean, to, we pay them. Obviously. Right, 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 of course. But, but, to, but yes. to, to create... Right, so like my engineer might you know make a drawing of a part or might need to make a modification and they can just on go your down telescope. to our basement. Yeah, the pieces that we attach to okay. our instruments. Yeah. Okay. That's you're, go and cut stuff. You're literally an instrumental as astrophysicist. I am, yeah. Okay. And that means that a lot of what you're doing is actually working on the equipment to... Yeah, I'm, I'm a little more uh, crossover in the sort of engineering world. I also study galaxy evolution. So I study local and distant galaxies. I, I have a project we're studying. Um, we're, we're measuring cosmology. So we're looking at how galaxies are evolving, like halfway back to the beginning of the universe. So we also do that. So I use data from other telescopes and projects as well. Does the public have access to, and would there actually be anything to see this place in New Mexico that you were talking about or in Chile? So so those telescopes, not, I'm trying to think, I don't think there's much uh, public access to APO, but there are many telescopes across the country, professional telescopes, that there is access. So one telescope, the Kapik National Observatory in Arizona, is about two hours outside of Tucson and has incredible and sort of ongoing public programs and has for many, many years. Uh, McDonald Observatory, which I worked at for my last job, is in West Texas and also has kind of a large public outreach and observing program. Um, And so, you know, I would say that if you're listening, you can look near you. I grew up uh, in Santa Cruz in California and Lick Observatory there also is pretty, pretty well known. I'll be in Chile later this year. Yeah, I would say that's less likely. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the, Chilean, the Chilean observatories that I know of do not have, they're both fairly remote and don't have big public. Oh, they don't. Outreach. Not that I know of. Oh. No. no. Yeah. I was looking forward to going. Yeah, you'll, ha- you'll have to see where, where depending on where you're going to be. Um, but there is a big chunk and it's possible some of the big radio telescopes too. Um, Alma is a new-ish radio telescope in, in the Atacama Desert up mm-hmm. there. So. I'll be running across the Atacama. <laughs> you can wave at the at the telescope dishes. I can. As you, I might get si- I might between them. Yeah, I might get sidetracked <laughs> there. So great. Well, thanks for that. The background there, I really appreciate it. So you uh, had mentioned to me before we started recording that you had kind of a circuitous route to where you are now. What what is your background and your your kind of history? Where did you grow up? So I grew up in Santa Cruz, which is about an hour and a half south of San Francisco, um, on the bay there. And 
it turns out it was a very lucky place to be born to be excited about astronomy because it certainly has one of the best astronomy departments in the world, which I didn't know when I was excited about mm-hmm. astronomy. When were um, you excited about it? Really early. So so I was a weird kid and, and was excited about stars very early on. Like how early? Um, Not 54? N- not 54. Uh, the running joke in my family that they claim is true, but, you know, it's always hard to know, was that my first word was moon because my dad used to, we lived up in the mountains when I was really little, and so he would take me out to look up. You know, it's hard to know how parents count first words, but yeah. they held on to that one. So I, so I always enjoyed it from very early on in school. I was excited about doing science and in particular about looking up and doing astronomy. Eventually, Did you know back then that you might want to you want you might want to make it a career? Well, really, I wanted to be an astronaut because who didn't want to be an astronaut at some point? Dino- we find usually dinosaurs or stars. Those are usually <laughs> how people split. And so I went to space camp when I was in fifth grade. And so that was when I like got the language to talk about astrophysics because they give you a thick old binder to, you know, what kind of jobs might you do? And the truth is astronauts come from all different really wild and delightful backgrounds. And I was pretty sure I didn't want to be an Air Force pilot. And so like astrophysicist is like not next on the list. And yeah. I was like, yeah, that sounds great. In What's alphabetical order, right? <laughs> totally. uh-huh. It's like, no, I don't want to cut things up. Astrophysics seems great. And so th- that sort of gave me the language to, to start to think about that and like ask those questions. I turns out being an astronaut was probably never in the books for me. I have titanium hips. So I've had rheumatoid arthritis since I was really little. And so, you know, I think we're not quite at the place where you get to have arthritis in space, although maybe soon. It's hard to know. (laughs) Things things are evolving quickly, right? (laughs) Um, Yeah. How how does that? We could make some argument. You know, it's like, you should send me up. We'll see how artificial soon rich old people will want to go up. I can help. I can help with that. And so, yeah. So I, you know, I enjoyed science. I was kind of terrible at math. I still have like deep, deep traumas of being like trapped at lunch time repeating my seven times tables and so you know so I I sort of struggled my way through but I was I was always excited about it and was kind of curious about how things worked so I liked taking things apart I you know was that kid I got my ham radio license when I was like 12 Uh, and you know but there were kind of those kinds of things if I look back there are things that make sense like that you know I I built different skills that were useful for me moving forward but mostly I was like what's interesting and where will I be tolerated so you did well in high school um, terrible in in high school oh you did like math I was a disaster I'm sure I was a terrible I'm so sorry I should send apology letters to every student I had I lasted three years I was able every teacher you had every teacher yeah yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, every teacher I had I'm sure I was an absolute nightmare. I was that student who was like, I I had answers to things. And it's exhausting sometimes when you're a teacher, when there's always a student who's like, I have a question. I have an answer. Let's do this. It's like, oh, God, man, sit down. I know. I know. We'll get there. And so, yeah, I, I, well, maybe like every 15-year-old everywhere, I did not have a lot of patience. It's gotten marginally better with time. I graduated after three years from high school. I would have dropped out, actually, except I had taken a lot of classes at our community college. So I had enough credit that I could graduate. Uh, my mom so was like a voice did, of reason. but You said you, you say you did terrible in high school, yeah. yet you graduated in three years. Yeah, it doesn't take as much as you expect to graduate from high school. My grades were fine and not great, right? So I never was patient enough or cared enough about getting don't tell my 12 year old who I'm like, <laughs> show up and do the work. Um, but I was never tolerant enough of the shenanigans to get A's if it didn't mean I was learning stuff, which again, I am sure I took years off my parents' lives and I apologize for that. But I did graduate. So that happened. Yeah. And then I spent a year. So, so sort of simultaneously, I had been taking classes at our community college. And that was probably the thing that that redeemed me in this direction. So graduate students from UC Santa Cruz taught the intro astronomy at the community college. And so I took the two classes you could take there. And one of the graduate students hired me to TA his, he taught an intro like summer class, intro astronomy class. So I TA'd that the year between my sophomore and junior year, because it turns out that Teaching astronomy, at, even at the college level, mostly the thing that people struggle with is is the math, is like fractions, right? So I did a lot of helping people with fractions and rearranging algebra equations and a thing which at 15 was like super fun and easy. And I was like, this is a blast. <laughs> They'd always be like, what year are you? It's like, I'm going into my junior year mm, somewhere, not yeah. here, not here. Of high um, school. I didn't tell them it seemed mean. So I did that. And then... Um, 
after I, he let me kind of help out with research a little bit as a high school student. And then eventually I started doing research, although I'll say research in air quotes, a faculty member let me muck around with his data. He let me reduce data and like sit in the basement at the university and play around on computers, which I did for a while. And I learned a ton. And eventually there's programs that are now pretty prevalent called research experience for undergraduates. So they, different research sites and departments can host summer programs that are usually eight to 10 weeks long and give undergraduate students a chance to try kind of what does research look like when you're not in classes? How do you go through the arc of having an idea and exploring it? And it turned out that there was a new REU program at the Cerro Tololo Observatory, which is one of the national sites in, in Chile. And actually, I, I took part the first year, which maybe was the winter of 1995, so like January of 1995. And unfortunately, it has since ended because I'm a thousand now. But it was a weird program because REUs run in the summer. But it ran during the Chilean summer. <laughs> so, so it winter, was January, yeah. February, March. Mm -hmm. And they opened the program and basically no one applied. Because if you were on the semester, you're kind of hosed. Like it's not a full semester. You lose a semester of school. And so like no one was really prepared for it. It matched a little better with quarters. But again, it was super last minute. And so I had already graduated. I actually was like staying with a friend in Washington, D.C. I had just sort of, I don't know didn't quite make my way back home. And so I applied for this REU program because the faculty member I worked for, his friend was running it. And he was like, this could be fun. And I was like, sure, why not? And so I, I applied. I was a student at San Jose State University for a semester. I, I never attended any classes, <laughs> but, I, but I was a college student and so could apply <laughs> to do this REU. And we were a totally motley crew of kind of returning students and people who were interested in astronomy through various paths because it was kind of a funny year. And it was great. So I, so then that winter I went down. So I, it was, it should have been my fourth year of high school, but I went down to Chile and I worked at the telescopes there. Amazing. Yeah, it was super fun. I freaked them out to no end. They gave me an office. I was like, you know, they thought I was someone's kid. And then it was like, oh, no, I work here now. And they were like, okay. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. At some point, my, my advisor, Malcolm Smith, who was at the time the director of the observatory, although at 17, I didn't really understand what that meant. I observed with him, which was super cool. And then he was like, oh, yeah, you know, you can just go up and like, I have a few nights, you can just go do them on your own. And I was like, because again, 17, you have no fear or like rational thought. So I, so I was like, yes, absolutely, I'll do this. And they gave me like the I fall in and I can't get up like emergency button. I don't even know where it rang. It might have rung in the big telescope because like grownups worked there. And and the telescope itself, so it has different functionality now, but you had to, so telescopes point and they have motors that make them move around and point at different places in the sky. And to, to move like, to do s small motion, you don't need a particularly strong motor, but, but you have to, it has to be really regular because you want it to keep track sure. with a particular object. So it has to keep a really regular motion. Uh, so the telescope we were using didn't have a particularly big motor for doing. So if you're looking, you know, to the south and now your new thing that you want to look at, your new star is in the north, you have to do what we call a slew. You have to do this big motion. The telescope didn't really have the juice to do that. So they had a big bar, like a big hand, handrail all around the outside of the bottom of the telescope. And so you had to swing it. I weighed like 95 pounds. <laughs> so, so I had to like, I have a picture of me somewhere. I had to grab the bar and then just like hang from it yeah. and like jump up and to down get to, to get enough momentum to get it, you know, and we had to like drag liquid nitrogen. So big like canisters full of like liquid nitrogen to cool off the instrument. So we have to like drag it up ladders and pour it in. So I had this little button, like in case a tarantula attacked or if something terrible happened, then I could push the button. Luckily, nothing terrible happened. But they clearly were like, I don't know, what is health and safety? Like, how did you get here? <laughs> well, it was run so, by Chileans. It was, well, no, so it's a national, it was a national program through the United States. The telescope okay. was an American telescope. Okay, because uh, there just was thinking, a lot of Chilean staff. But. Yeah, I was just thinking that that other countries take so much more risk because they're not concerned about getting sued. Oh, yes. You know, but it is drastically different from place to place. But no, this was an American. Thing. Okay. But, you know, far from home. So mm -hmm. so you spent the winter down there mm -hmm. and then you came back? I didn't actually. So so I ended up, I, I did a program in Israel called an Ulpan. Although, in fact, I did not. It's a, it's a way to like go and work and then learn Hebrew and travel. And that was also a strange experience because it turned out the... 
there was like a person on the kibbutz running the program. And then we like found out she was embezzling money. And it was a whole thing. It was interesting. I worked the night shift at a plastic corrugation factory um, and traveled some. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> so terrible. It was, it was real weird. I don't know. You know, again, the things you endure where it's like, it's not for long. Right. And when you're 17, um, 18 years old, you right. can endure so I traveled a lot. and explored. And, uh, and then eventually I came back home and, and started college briefly at the University of Arizona. So what's the circuitous route? Yeah, well, I didn't graduate from the University of Arizona. <laughs> What happened there? (laughs) Well, so it's interesting in retrospect. You know, at the time, I actually, my mom filled out most of my application for college. I was like, I'm not that interested. Working at the observatory was great. And like, I'm the thought of being in a place for a period of time was more than I was interested in. But I did, in fact, have good enough like SAT scores and whatever that they were willing to be enthused about me. And U of A has a great program and is quite active, actually, ironically, in astronomical instrumentation. At 18, I maybe did not entirely appreciate it. (laughs) I spent that semester mostly juggling on the quad. Uh, Literally juggling. Literally juggling. Um, (laughs) Hacky sacks? Nope, nope. Clubs mostly. (laughs) You know, at 18, I was exploring the world. My first physics class by someone old who has for sure since retired. He was, you know, your standard old dude professor. And he would draw like boobs and like make boob jokes like on the stick figures for the physics and I just I just didn't go I I think I made it probably through three classes and I got a d in that class because I literally never attended and was like great good luck to you see if you had attended like I did my astronomy I might have gotten a b anything is possible (laughs) yeah so I did that I worked in the music library and I juggled and I dropped out I was just like I have (laughs) no interest in this so I did that and then I ended up spending a year and a half uh, attending Goddard College in Vermont, but not in Vermont. I moved back to California. So Goddard has this fantastic remote bachelor's program. And so you go for a week every semester and you meet with your advisor. And so I did kind of a, and you design your own curriculum and decide what you want to do. And so I did kind of a, I was interested in the overlap between physics and philosophy and how kind of where physics and society overlapped. And so I did that. And my last semester, which I should probably check, I don't, it's possible I didn't even get credit for that. I ended up having a hip replacement. Mm. So I, so I, I was working in Santa Cruz and traveling and attending Goddard in Vermont. And then I've had arthritis since I was little. And eventually, which we sort of knew was coming, my super, my one joint, my right hip was always a disaster, finally was like, and we're done. Uh, And so I had a hip replacement, which, you know, luckily, uh, my family's great. And I was able to do that at home and... And yeah. recover and everything. And recover uh-huh. and all those things. Um, but so that sort of s- slowed me down a bit there. And while How I old were lay you there, then? I was ooh, 19. And I had really enjoyed the time, sort of the ele- intellectual room at Goddard to get to kind of go all over the place. Especially, you know, now looking back, I think it was very much a reaction to feeling very unsupported in Arizona and feeling very much that like I was not the kind of person who did physics, which was a sharp contrast to having just lived on a mountain and done physics, right? And so it was, I think, that trying to reconcile those things and, like, see why that was broken. And then I wanted to go back to do physics. And so, luckily, I was in Santa Cruz, which has a great department. And so I applied late, and they took me, and I was able to start the next quarter. Um, And so so I went back to, to... to a more traditional program and entered the physics program at Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. And then you finished out there? I did. So that was only university four if we count San Jose State. Um, Five if we count the community college. I finished out at Santa Cruz. Actually, no, see, that's a lie too. I did my last two classes at the University of Leeds in England because I got to the end of my degree in my last year I met my husband and he was, he had one more year in England. And so I followed him back. (laughs) And I finished my last two classes. So what is your degree in and where is it from? Yeah, it's from the University of Santa Cruz, uh, University of California, Santa Cruz in physics in 2001, I think, (laughs) probably in the end. What brought you back to Seattle or to Seattle? So Seattle is a recent move for me. We've been here four years and it was for for this job. Um, And so we had been living in Austin before that and then New York City before that. And then did you go on to get a master's or PhD? Eventually, yeah. So after I... Both in in astronomy and physics, they usually come together. There are some terminal master's programs, but most PhD programs issue you a master's along the way. I worked in industry before that, so I graduated. I worked. I didn't actually do astronomy at Santa Cruz. 
because <laughs> why would I? Uh, so I ended up, I wanted to do something useful. So I did condensed matter physics. Which, Astronomy isn't useful. I mean, it keeps me <laughs> off the street. So in that sense, uh -huh. I will say that, you know, it keeps people out of trouble. So I, I did condensed matter. So that more is working with materials. And so I worked at that point, actually, I, in the land of humorous things, we made light emitting devices using special plastics called polymers, but they're spin cast. So you just like do spin art. <laughs> and so I did that for my undergrad degree. And I ended up working at a company that my advisor had been an advisor for. And so I helped start up a company in, outside of Santa Cruz. Um, and there we did screen printing. So I was like, I have a degree in physics, but I'm really good at spin art and also screen printing. <laughs> Those were things I spent a lot of time doing. Do you consider yourself a type A personality? Like, do you do you find yourself really driven? Uh, because you don't you don't sound like it. And the way you're describing yourself, yeah. because you said, oh, it's so circuitous, and I've done this, and I've done that, and I've done this. Yeah. But that could also be looked at as, I think someone could describe it a different way and just yeah. say, I like to do a lot of different things, sure. and I needed to find my way, and then boom, and then well, here but you so are doing it amazing wasn't, right? So I graduated with my degree. I spent a year working at a startup, and then I joined VistaCorps, which is, it's kind of the equivalent of like the American Peace Corps, right? So there's like the Conservation Corps, and then the VistaCorps. And VistaCorps is kind of like, they send administrators to nonprofits around the United States. So I spent a year kind of working off some student loans um, in New York City doing nonprofit fundraising before I went back eventually to astronomy. Anyone listening who knows me will indeed tell you that I probably am a type, type A person, but I've sort of reached my capacity to be actually that organized. And, and perhaps it's been, you know, moderated for various reasons throughout time. But I think that I'm at least, <laughs> I've slowed down if nothing else. I, you know, I, I certainly was doing things because they interested me, but it wasn't necessarily because I had to get to a certain end point, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So four years now as an assistant professor, you know, one of the things that I found so interesting and appealing to me to chat with you about is that you're very vocal and, you know, very outspoken about social issues. Mm -hmm. Is that is that a fair assessment that of it, that it's social sure. is mm -hmm. issues? And you've written quite a bit. I've uh, read, and I'll link to these in the show notes, you've written some articles on Medium about really trying to make your field more diverse mm -hmm. and inclusive. Mm -hmm. Where does that desire come from? Yeah, so I think that there's a lot of pieces that probably bring that together. Part of it probably comes from my experience as a white woman in the field. Part of it, I think, just comes from... Because you don't feel included or because of yeah, what you Yeah, I mean, I think seeing. that I've certainly both of those things. So I think that, you know, some, some people manage to navigate through to various parts of their career without feeling like they've been biased against, feeling supported, feeling like they make those connections. But I think many of us have had at least some occurrences where, you know, even sometimes it's like, I'm going to not work with that person because I... I hear they're not great to women in lab or, you know, I hear they're kind of racist or I hear, right. So there's, I would say that in general for folks that are minoritized, once you talk to people, even if they have not experienced targeted harassment in that way, their career has been shaped by trying to find spaces in which they had the opportunity to really focus on their work as opposed to avoiding danger. So, you know, in terms of like why that matters to me, and it's interesting because it's something I have thought about kind of where does that come from? Because clearly some people aren't interested at all. <laughs> like why, why would you care? Go do your work. You know, I come from certainly within my family and within my community. So I like, I, I grew up in a reformed Jewish household and the idea is basically that you if there is injustice occurring, it is your job to work on it. Like that's just kind of one of the baselines. And the baseline so, for your family or for the both. Jewish community. I mean, you, you know, I, I would say that it, like all communities, it varies wildly from sort of micro community to micro community. So I, you know, I, I won't speak broadly for everyone who's Jewish, but I will say that certainly a, a recurring theme around justice is prevalent. Um, and certainly, you know, here we attend a reconstructionist synagogue, but that idea of sort of, you, you have to do that work, right? The idea that if you see injustice, you know, something you, you need to get involved and mm -hmm. you, need you need to speak, to speak up. up. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you have any of that power to redistribute, part of your job is to make sure you're doing that. And so it's interesting, actually, because as I moved into this position as a faculty member, I had been, I was a 
postdoctoral researcher and a research scientist in Texas. And I will say, actually, there's, you know, many, I am sort of the tip of the iceberg. We have many wonderful activists throughout many career levels in astronomy who have been doing wonderful work to sort of try and change the field and the climate and even, you know, society more largely. You know, for me, I was pretty sure I had done, you know, been involved in various work through my undergraduate career. I was really lucky at Santa Cruz. There's actually an amazing program called the History of Consciousness Program. Donna Haraway is there who does a lot of history of science and technology and like very revolutionary like feminist thinking. So I had to take a class from her. There's just, there's a lot of really kind of, I would say, you know, interesting interdisciplinary thinkers in that space that I got a chance to be exposed to. For me, it felt like a very natural transition, but I, through graduate school, you know, did, did not do a ton of activism. So I was pretty locked down. I, I flew a balloon for NASA twice. I had a baby. I was not looking out a lot at that time. And when I took my postdoctoral position in Texas, it was sort of like, okay, I, I got the PhD. I, I, for me, I really was like, I can only, I think I can only be successful doing this if I really, you know, put on my blinders at some level. And I did that briefly. And I had the privilege to be able to do that. I was in a place where that was possible, which I'm grateful for. I think that, you know, after that, I got back to Texas, and I was really feeling disconnected from that community of activism. Um, you know, even in New York, peripherally, because I had worked at actually a Jewish organization when I did VistaCore called Avoda, I we had connections there. And so it was easier to sort of keep that going, even if it was just at a low level to be involved. Um, and, you know, I, I say we weren't activists, but we, you know, were out there marching against the war and all those things. But, you know, it wasn't like sort of a central part of what I was doing. I got to Texas and it was both something I was interested in re in investing in and being connected, but it also felt like being in Texas, that was a thing that was more necessary for me, finding that community actively. You know, being a progressive Jew in New York, it's like you just have to talk to another person on the street and you can find them. <laughs> and there are another, there's another progressive Jew. It's not, you know, Jew. and then it's yeah. like you, you hit Texas and actually there are lots of Jews in Texas, but it was, you know, it was not a necessary, an obvious thing there. So I ended up volunteering with a local abortion fund and ended up serving on their board. Um, and working their hotline for the whole time that we were in Texas. And so for me, that was a big sort of activist growth opportunity that really connected me with community that I hadn't been connected with before. And I under, you know, there was a lot of different opportunities for education and growth for me personally that then I got to reinvest in the community in Texas. And um, so I think, you know, a lot of sort of my growth as a human and as an activist and as a thinker happened in that context. And then I was able to kind of translate that back to what was happening in the field um, in astronomy. And so, in terms of in terms of your work at the UW and your your position at the UW, mm -hmm. so when I look at that list, the faculty list, uh, about half of it is women. Yes, but there's not a lot of diversity other than that. That's right. There, I think there might be one or two Hispanics, if I'm not mistaken. On our on our faculty? Right, on the faculty. N uh, not in the astronomy faculty, but in the physics faculty. Okay. We have a few uh, Latino staff. So it's, all, it's not all white, is it? There's no one of In color? our department? Yeah. I, I don't want to put you on the spot because I don't yeah. know if you... But no, I mean, it just so I, guess, like... I guess what I'll say is this. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the racial diversity is terrible in astronomy. It's, you know, I'll say it's marginally less bad in physics at some level because physics is a much larger field. And so you, even at very low statistics, you still get a few people. But it's certainly like at my career level, it's very, very low. So what do you make of Neil deGrasse Tyson? Neil's great. So I, so Neil's PhD is from Columbia and, and he came back. Where so you like, went? I, where uh, I, sorry, where, yes, where yeah. I got my PhD. Mm -hmm. And so, so I, I know Neil, he has spent time in the department there. Neil is fantastic. I think that, you know, we're, we're grateful to have him as someone who is speaking for astronomy. You know, occasionally we have political disagreements. There have been some issues around sexual harassment too, which I think is an issue that. Yeah. He got caught up in the Me Too movement. I mean, he? you know, so I think that that in that sense, I, I won't hold him up as like everyone be like Neil. I think there's a lot of stuff to work out there. But, but I think um, we probably, we may, we as a society yeah. may have a false idea of who is in astronomy because he is our personal uh, yeah, astrophysicist, I mean, I, I will say, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, every time we have someone who expands our idea of what different fields can look like, so like what astronomers can look like, I am grateful for that 
I, you know, humans tend to do better when they have examples. Right. Like Obama. So, right. You know, I think that I'm always grateful for that. I do think that we frequently get stuck, you know, especially in science, although truly everywhere. We like the idea of individuals, especially in American society. We like the idea of great individuals and that idea of sort of independent thinkers and people sort of breaking those boundaries alone. I think what we find is that in general, that's not the case, that there's you know, if we, something that I teach in my class, we try to look at discoveries and understand the intellectual and historical context around those discoveries and how they were made and how we think about them and how they're celebrated. So we do occasionally have really revolutionary thinkers who introduce individual ideas, but many or most of the progress that gets made gets made in a very collaborative and collective way. So I use the example of, um, a Nobel Prize was given many years ago for the discovery of the cosmic microwave background. And the uh, scientists who discovered it were, were not looking for it. <laughs> they, they had a telescope they were trying to use for something else. And they were trying to, it's a radio telescope. And so they had noise that they couldn't identify. It turns out both that there was a project down the road that had predicted it, that th there was a group that was trying to build a telescope to measure it. It had been predicted by another group in Russia. It turned out it actually had been measured maybe 15 years earlier by another scientist who had just discarded it because it hadn't been predicted yet in theory. So it was just like, I don't know, this they is don't junk, know what we'll it throw is, it yeah. out. And so I think there's a lot of that kind of thing where, you know, we have evolution of ideas and technology and interactions. And so we see science much more as kind of this collective motion that's happening and individuals are required and take part. And you definitely see, you know, different projects have people who really cheerlead and push it through and fight for it. Right. I think about here in Washington, we have LIGO, which is the gravitational wave observatory, one of the pieces of it. And, you know, people thought gravitational waves were undetectable. There were, there were, it was, it was certainly a thing that was kind of seen as not laughable, but was definitely one of those like, oh yeah, maybe one day we'll get that. That seems basically impossible. You know, now we're measuring them all the time. And to get the resources invested, you definitely had people who both had to fight the technical battles to figure it out and the, the political battles, both institutionally at the federal level, right? Getting money to do big things is hard. It requires that investment. But the idea that like one person makes something happen in that way is frequently not the case. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, getting back to thinking about how, how do we change both what scientists look like, I think a lot more of it too is changing also, what do we think about science? Like, how do we think about how science happens? But, you know, so this idea that you have to have part of why I think less people end up thinking of themselves as scientists or scientific thinkers is because we think about this idea of, you know, you have to be the smartest person in the room and you have to, you're having these wild ideas just come out of the blue because your brain is exploding with brilliance. And, you know, that's, that is not so much. I, mean, I had the opportunity while I was at Columbia, I served on a weird committee, mostly with people who are very senior to me in a different field. And one of them won the Nobel Prize the next year. And I was like, this is weird. I get to send an email. Congratulations. Uh, but I was lucky to get to talk to him. And funnily enough, like the committee sort of teased him about not getting the Nobel Prize the year before, which was extra weird. And we, we talked about it. And, and he was, I thought, very reasonable. He was like, look, the thing I'm winning the Nobel Prize for would have happened if I had never existed. Might it have been at a slightly different time or in a slightly different way? Sure. But this is where our field was moving. This was going to happen, right? This was in the air. And, you know, again, individuals influence the path, but they're not like creating the stream most of the time, right? There, you know, there's a few exceptions to that, I would say. But in general, sort of the progress of science is not, you know, an individual standing on a rock shouting. And I, I think that unfortunately, because we think about that, idea of individual brilliance, we then tend to tolerate bad behavior from people we have identified as brilliant to not negatively impact sort of human progress or whatever the excuses we tell ourselves. And then that feeds into uh, this kind of replication of oppression that we see in society at large, because it means that you sort of give people free passes for extremely crummy behavior. And you're also not promoting the diversity within that group or the people who That's right. can collectively... That's right. And so I think that, you know, so there's there's many different paths, but I think that um, 
you know, kind of breaking that, that addiction to individual brilliance is probably part of what we have to do. You know, and of course, like there are people, you know, as you said, you know, your astronomy class may not have been the most compelling class you had. It is helpful to have people that are compelling and tell a good story. Humans love good stories. It's kind of how our brains are wired. And so it's really the thing that speaks to us. You know, and so there's there's some terrible mashup between kind of the, the way that humans like processing stories and then, you know, this need for like individuals who, who blaze paths. So I, so I think at least for me, per, part of that work has been really trying to make sure that we acknowledge the different ways that the ideas and the work evolves. Um, of course, you know, now certainly we're better about it. We see, you know, I was talking about LIGO, you get a paper with hundreds of people on it. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, recognizing that there are just so many pieces that right, they're all contributing. Doing, that's right, this big work. How do you change the makeup of your classroom? Yeah, so it is, it is multifaceted. So there are some places where as a junior faculty member, I have more control, and there are places where I have less control. So we do graduate admissions every year. And the University of Washington, well before I got here, so part, part of why I like our department so much. Um, so you mentioned, for example, that our gender balance is not unreasonable. That has been something that has been a, a very intentional choice by the department for many decades. Um, it is something the department has worked towards for many decades. Uh, and so it, it was assisted by a program, I want to say in the early 90s, that put aside money to hire into tenure track faculty positions, women in the sciences. So, you know, and there's, there's a lot of debates about kind of what the right way to do is, but at least from my very limited experience at this level, at the end of the day, if you want to make change at the professional level, universities have to put aside money that is earmarked for people who are not being hired. Departments will not change their demographics unless someone hands them money to do it. In, in the form of what? A faculty lines. So, for example, you know, if, if you find a qualified, in this case, if you can find a qualified woman, we will let you hire an extra professor. So, literally a bribe. <laughs> you know, I, I think that if we looked up the technical term, it's not a bribe. Uh, but certainly the way money moves in universities, the way money moves anywhere, right? It's what are you incentivized to do? And, the, you know, if you ask, I, I will, I'm going to make a broad breast statement about, about society. If people have resources or power, it is extremely unusual that they will give that up if it feels like they're losing part of a pie that is limited. And so in, in sort of the totally most vulgar, vulgar terms, when we are trying to, to change what, what our communities look like, most groups are happy how they are. So if you just ask people in general, they'll be like, oh, inclusion is so important. I wish we had less white people. It's like, cool. Who are you going to fire so you can hire someone who's not white? <laughs> like, no one's going to do that. Although I, I will say, I will take this moment to say, one time, I one time in the nonprofit world did see a white woman step down with the requirement that they hire because they were serving primarily people of color. She was like, I should not be leading this organization. You need an executive director who's not white. Mm -hmm. Is the one time in my entire life, and that was in the reproductive justice movement in Texas. It's the only time I've seen someone do that. I think it is the exception that makes the rule. And even if you tell people you need to have people on your short list who aren't white men, you need to expand, you need to be thinking about many communities, right? Something we haven't talked about yet. You know, queer students frequently don't have anyone to identify with in their community. Then we know that the experience for, for queer physicists and astronomers is not great. We know they face all sorts of discrimination. If you picked someone random out of the community and you were like, are we biased? They would say no. But obviously the experience of people who are queer is very different from what the perceived experience from folks in the majority is. So, you know, I think that, you know, what we're seeing is that there, there have to be incentives. So, I, so that's the one thing is that well, I don't have a lot of leverage there, but we're working on that. I, I want to interject just briefly. The thing that I cannot understand right now is that, and I haven't been paying close attention to um, the Democratic candidates, mm -hmm. but um, I did hear something recently that just shocked me. And I just thought, how can we be after, you know, after the past couple of years, we're all talking about more diversity and more women. And we're looking at, 
of the top candidates were looking at old white men again. And I'm like, how the hell did that happen? I don't understand. And it's like, it has nothing to do with you or I. Like, I don't think it's the machine. It's like whoever is running that machine is pushing these people through. It's a mixture, right? I don't think it's the machine. I think, I mean, there's the machine and the machine is a problem. People, (laughs) I think, primarily are motivated through comfort and fear. And certainly this election is going to be a lot about fear and a little bit about comfort. You know, I think that there are lots of pros and cons for many of the Democratic candidates. And I'm excited to see who comes out of that, out of that in one piece and will support them. Or as someone told me, like, I would support a banana also. I, would, <laughs> I am pretty flexible well, as long as... Others supported an orange. So. <laughs> life, is, life is full of choices. So, you know, I think that, that it is still seen as risky. You know, the irony is, again, people will say, I believe this thing. So I think right now we couch it a lot in... For the election, we talk about electability. I see certainly in when I look in science, sometimes you see people talk about quality. Sometimes you see them talk about things like comfort or fit. All those things are code words usually for racism or sexism, almost always, um, or some other ism where they're saying, I, you know, this person doesn't feel culturally like me. And so I don't think this is a good idea. I will say that the things that are not incentivized, so many universities have developed hiring rubrics to try to make things more fair, have made things much more transparent, all of that. Over and over again, I will say our inherent societal biases tend to reproduce themselves, whatever mechanisms we're given, unless there is a very intentional move to not do so, and in general, incentivization changes that. You know, I, probably a huge part of it comes from the fact that, like, welcome to capitalism. That's how people make decisions. Again, if people don't feel like they're losing something, right, there's this. Now, I will also say that the pie is infinitely fungible at the university. Some, you know, simultaneously, there are both no resources and infinite resources. And the question is trying to figure out how to match those things up with what needs to happen. So I think as universities make more intentional choices, as departments make more intentional choices, that changes what happens. So that's part of it. I will also say the University of Washington, before my arrival, I have no credit for this, has taken the lead in doing a lot of work around graduate student admissions. So looking at barriers that are keeping students out who traditionally have been underrepresented, be it because of their, say, first generation status, because of their race, all of, you know, I their non-traditional status in a variety of ways, people who might be returning to the field or coming from other, um, other places. And so our graduate admissions process is now, I would say, being modeled in many more places than it was initially. So traditionally, you would look at someone's grade point average and at their physics GRE score and maybe their letters from people they'd worked with. And so we really work hard to try to do holistic admissions and is that across the board at the UW or in, in This is just, your I, can only, I only okay. work in my department. So graduate admissions are, are specific to departments um, and tend to be different from field to field as well because there's wildly different programs. So this is, we do a PhD program. And, you know, and so that is somewhere where I think many of us in our department are very committed to, you know, first getting people in the door and figuring out why that hasn't historically happened. And then sort of asking what I think Weirdly is a much harder to answer question, but maybe not weirdly, which is what are the other ways that we are not supporting students, say students of color or queer students who are walking into spaces that have been traditionally, you know, what you think of in sort of the most stereotypical sciencey way. What does that look like to think about it through someone else's eyes and be like, you know, so I made the joke earlier, like, you know, in New York, being a Jewish progressive person is not an isolating experience. (laughs) And then, you know, say moving out to Texas, like it's a very different kind of experience. I think that so many of us have had those, you know, at low levels experiences where we do or don't fit into the community in different ways. You know, when we we look at, at folks who have been minoritized in science, especially folks who are racially minoritized, it tends to be much, much worse. And, you know, there's less opportunity just as figuring out that navigation, right? There's a lot more microaggressions. There's a lot more sort of people asking you, like, do you really belong here in small and big ways? And so I think something 
as we've gotten, we've improved our admissions process to really collect folks from from a much broader range of backgrounds. And does that mean like just simply through the application process, you're looking at diversity or are there programs that go out into the schools, maybe into... Yeah. So I, so I would say in general for us, it has to, you know, we have, it's two pronged, but, but in fact, I think in general, we find that there's a, there are more and more all the time programs that are kind of reaching out, right? So that are working with maybe middle school age kids that are opening the door for high school kids. The department here uh, does have quite a, a number of those things. So we have both like a mobile planetarium that folks take all over the state to, to many schools that might not otherwise have access to that kind of resource. There's UW in the classroom at the high school level. There are So there's a lot of sort of those cross-pollinating resources. By the time people get to graduate applications, though, they usually have to have completed an undergraduate degree in physics. So, so you know, there is like, what are we doing locally in our program? to you know, give people access to those opportunities. But there is kind of that disconnect, right? Because like the student you know, who came who was like, oh, I'm not sure I did enough math before, there are all sort of the junctures where we can help people stay engaged or sort of get the access that they're looking for. So I think you know, now I've been thinking a lot more about are there things in the larger way that sort of our community is operating that are kind of structural changes that need to happen to make the... Gen- you know, the academic space less hostile to folks, right? Because of course, there is also the issue where I might be able to control my lab and sort of do the best I can there. And inevitably, I will still screw stuff up there or maybe my department. Even by the time you get to the scope of the university, right, there's tens of thousands of people, you know, and of course, as my students graduate or my postdocs move on, they are moving out into the world, into the field, into jobs, you know, into industry. The thing that makes their lives better in the you know, it's like, A, I can figure out ways to support them in the moment, but also, you know, it's it's sort of the same with my children. Then they have to go into the world, right? And the world is kind of a hot mess right now. So, you know, part of it is kind of thinking, how do we do the immediate and the local and the micro? And what are the big changes we have to make? You know, so they're not sitting in the same chair I'm sitting in 20 years from now being like, well, I made it through, and it's still terrible, right? Is it, so um, it's sort of the zoom in, zoom out. You could talk uh, as specifically or not specifically as you want about this, but is it pretty terrible in your field? And I think that's like that's the thing that impresses me so much. And, and the reason why I wanted to chat was that, you know, you're a woman in the sciences. Is it pretty bad? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I, you know, I've had sort of the advantage, I guess, of being, you know, in the workforce in a variety of ways and like being in the world in a variety of ways. And, and I will say that I think that astronomy is, is on par with society as a whole. I, you know, I, I don't think, I don't think we're a ton better or a ton worse. I think we're working on being more transparent and more honest. And so there are moments when it, you know, when people are like, but look at all this sexual harassment. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to put down every other field, but I think we've been working very hard to try to bring those things to the surface, to try to improve the tools, to try to hold our colleagues accountable. And so, you know, the fact that like, we're willing to talk with reporters about it, for example, then it's like, oh, astronomy is terrible. It's like, well, hmm. Try try the next department over. I suspect if you shake shake the bushes, you'll you'll find it's not great either. So I, I don't think we're special awful. I think that we're small, and so sometimes in the scheme of things, right? So like our big national conference just happened in Honolulu. I think there were like thirty six hundred people there, which is a not small number, but isn't a big number either. And so sometimes making changes that still feel small, but are changes. So for example, we don't use the physics GRE anymore for graduate admissions. The physics GRE is notoriously a disaster. It is one of those things that appears to correlate with no measures of success most of the time. So departments, it it was the kind of thing where everyone was deeply wedded to using it. And over not so many years, it went from being a thing that was central to graduate admissions to being a thing that is much more put by the wayside. Many more places, it's either optional or you know it's not used in any way. And that was progress that happened pretty quickly. Partially, I think, because you know there's not that many programs, there's not that many departments in any particular location, for example. And so once there was critical mass of departments saying, this is not a thing we think is important, 
then like jumping on that bandwagon is safer, right? And so, you know, I think we see, for example, in physics departments, because they're bigger, because they're sort of more of other connections that they have to disentangle, you see slower progress in that kind of way. And also there are many people who are still wonderful and doing really good and important work, but you don't see it. It doesn't look so much like the field is moving, right? So like there's just enough of us that sometimes when we throw our weight, the boat goes one way. You know, that being said, again, I also don't think we're magically better either. You know, we're not somehow like hugely ahead of the pack or doing things that are absolutely the best ever. I think that we do try to think about if we figure out something that seems to be working, can we model that and share it for for other people? places. But I, you know, I, I think we're totally boringly, boringly average. We're societally average. What's the retention rate like for, uh, for women specifically in a department like yours? Oh, um, the short answer is, I don't know. It's probably self-protective because thinking about it makes me sad. It's, it, I would say that in my department, we don't see hardly any turnover. People tend to stay in the field as a whole. And in general, people tend to open it up to astronomy and physics just to get numbers enough to be interesting. We certainly know that statistically, actually in STEM, women leave more at every, as you go to increasingly senior job stages, women leave more. And so even if you start pretty even, which I want to say we're pretty close to parity at some early stages, that gets worse and worse at every job stage. Why is that? Many people have guessed many things, and probably all of them are true some. Again, in general, I think that the very, very uh, short answer is society is sexist. And when you do cost-benefit analysis as you move through your life, the likelihood is just it becomes higher that you will have had reasons that that mean leaving seems like the easier option. So, I, so you know, I think that if I think about individual stories about why people have left, you know, some, some of them are related to, say, harassment. Some of them are just people making decisions about themselves or their families. Um, I think there are many things that would have to change before that number changed considerably. Is it difficult, like specifically at the UW, to have a child and then stay on? Is there any kind of support in terms of that? I mean, I guess I would say I have yet to have, is there any support as a woman having a child in the United States in 2020 that is easy? Well, not easy, but are you, I, I guess <laughs> it's, are, it's, it's never good. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, you know, again, I think both academia is not special, you know, state by state, it, it varies wildly. I would say the university of Washington is trying to keep up with some trends in things like family leave and what that looks like and having some, right, the state of Washington now, you have access to, to paid family leave. You know, we were very lucky that my daughter was in, in the UW daycare, which was great. I've never been at a university that had enough daycare spaces or subsidized enough daycare spaces, you know, for people that were having, having kids. You know, I had my son in graduate school and that was actually a really good time to have a baby in many ways. But, you know, my husband and I were both graduate students. We basically split the days. So we would each go in for six or seven hours and then spend six or seven hours home with our son until he went into daycare when he was like just past a year. But be partially, it was great to be able to have that time with him. We just couldn't afford to do anything else in New York. Um, getting an infant into daycare is almost impossible. And when my daughter was born... I went back to work four weeks later because I had some sort of management responsibilities and that was sort of a thing. And my husband was basically fired because I was pregnant. So, you know, I, I would say that like there's, That's there's a lot of, it was pretty delightful, obviously. We later found out that his, his postdoctoral, his boss was kind of notoriously a disaster. But yeah, yeah, she found out that I was having a baby and basically just started trying to harass him into quitting, which he didn't do. And she didn't manage to like officially, and it's actually quite easy to hire, fire postdocs in Texas because you're on short term, like year long contracts. So firing is not that hard. Um, but she was so sure she could bully him out of the job that she didn't actually uh, like start proceedings to try to fire him because she didn't have any reason for firing him that he then took leave to stay home with our daughter, the you know legal leave that right. leave that FMLA gives you. And the day after he came back, she fired him. Then he got to stay home with our daughter, so that was great. But you know, it's not like the most relaxing way you'd like that to happen. So, you know, I would say that our experience was not great, 
but fairly average. It could, it could have been much worse. And so, yeah, you know, I think at the University of Washington, our salaries changed so drastically from step to step that it can be hard to compare well. There is not great subsidization here. Daycare is expensive mm-hmm, everywhere, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and that's that is often a stumbling block, you know. But I will say, in general, I think societally we do a pretty poor job of figuring out how to how to help families navigate that or what that looks like to sort of do a career. I am very lucky to be in this career stage where, you know, before I came to talk to you, I could like take my daughter to physical therapy and then go and do other things. And right, so I I have now reached the job stage where there's there's usually quite a lot of flexibility. I've worked jobs where you had to punch in and out. Having children in a job where I had to punch in and out, or you know, someone else was setting my shifts, would be harder by an order of magnitude. So you so have I'm a, grateful for that. You have a, a son who's twelve and yeah, a daughter who's I have a sixth grader and a kindergartner. Okay, and your yeah. daughter's six. Did six, you say? Yeah, she just what um, what are you trying to instill upon them? Like, do you uh, like not only in terms of astronomy and the work that you do, but just in life? How do you, how do you instill those lessons on them? Like, are you or was your daughter's first word moon? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> No, although she, yeah, she's really adorable. Right now, I think she wants to be, well, we'll see, an artist and an astronaut. We're real into A words maybe in our house. This may be the genetic thing. No, so, I, you know, she we used to She might be an joke, Air Force pilot. Yeah, that's also a choice. <laughs> she very well might. Uh, yeah, we used to joke that um, we'd really love one of our children to do like a real job. Like maybe someone could be a plumber so we could actually eventually retire would be really <laughs> fantastic. Either of them, I'm very flexible. No, I think, you know, in general... Well, really, my main like local goals are that they occasionally eat protein and that they go to sleep before I am exhausted. Those are like my two main goals, which are only occasionally achieved. You know, in terms of how they are in the world, I think for us, it's very important that they both recognize the resources they have and figure out how to use them to also make the world better. Um, So, you know, we do try to talk a lot about, about kind of being active in the communities that you're in and what that means for taking care of people around you. And we do that lots of ways. We try to sort of do that locally in our family. Through our temple, I lead a Girl Scout Daisy troop. Uh, You know, just different ways that how, how do we take responsibility for each other and what does that look like? In terms of job paths, I'm very Are they interested in what you're doing? So it's funny, they, they don't always know. Yes. So I will say recently, they suddenly care about our jobs or my job, which is very funny, because certainly for big chunks of time, you could be like, what is your mom doing? They're like, I don't know. She works at the university, like, blah, blah. Space, she, but she's maybe. always looking out at the sky. Space, I don't know, something. Like, it's funny, because it's, you know, less fun for them. I, my son has been very interested in aerospace engineering. Seattle is a good place for him to think that's interesting. And what does your husband do? He right now is a manager. He's working at a startup in town that's working on industrial robots. Mm. Um, His degree actually is in biochemistry and biophysics. Um, But he does a lot of like big structural thinking stuff. So he's working with them. Yeah. So, I mean, they think that's fun because robots. Yeah, of course. Uh, That's like our family trend. But mostly I think my son these days enjoys, he, he plays clarinet in the band and the jazz band and the marching band <laughs> so i think he, he's real excited about that yeah and and miriam mostly crashes into things um <laughs> so they both have this fun. artistic bent though yeah so you're, yeah you're not quite yeah, sure they, which way we'll see we'll see what happens but i M- miriam definitely loves math in a way that maybe no one else in our family has like she just loves it which is great and she's so she's really digging into that yeah but, good for her yeah, wow. we'll see what happens so just to get back to that, my question earlier yeah. about how you can diversify your own classroom, like I know like the yeah. UW has a has a, a way to kind of look at that and, and choose more diverse candidates. Is there sure. anything that you personally can do? That's a great question that I frequently ask myself and do not yet have a great answer for. The thing that, that I would say that I think I, you know, in any given year, not so much, A thing that I have been working, we have a great center for teaching and learning at the University of Washington that has been kind of bringing in external expertise and sort of doing brainstorming around this about as someone who's white, how, what can I do within my classroom to make that space something that's better for, you know, for folks that, for, you know, black and other people of color, for, for students coming in, making sure that space is something that is not a disaster. You know, even if it's small and big ways, what does that look like? So there, there there's certainly some pedagogy work that people are doing in that area that I've been trying to engage with. You know, again, for me, I think a lot of it is these larger structural, structural issues, right? So if all of our faculty are white, 
right? If you're walking into, and this is, again, not just astronomy, when students of color are walking into institutions that are primarily white, what message is that sending people, uh, students in particular? And so, you know, I do think that a lot of it does come down to we need to figure out supporting and recruiting colleagues of color and, and the institutional change that needs to happen for sort of overall for society to shift in that direction. Because the thing that I see far too much that makes me really nervous and unhappy is, you know, there are a lot of really wonderful HBCUs and minority serving institutions in the United States. Which, what's HBCUs? Uh, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. You know, many people who are black who graduate with PhDs go back to HBCUs to serve their community for lots of excellent reasons. So, you know, there's, I, I think we have to be mindful of not poaching people from places where they're doing really powerful work in their communities because it makes us look better. I think there is frequently, and you know, I've actually, I've seen it hiring wh white women as well. You see smaller or less enriched universities who have invested in folks coming up through their careers and other universities will basically come and poach them. And so then they just hire another guy in their place, right? So it's like, there's a lot of shuffling of a small number of people. It's both not healthy for the community, but it's also individuals feel huge amounts of stress you know, suddenly one person will, will pop up onto the job market. And there's a lot when you're expected to carry everything for your community, right? I think there, there are many demographics where right now people are like the only one or one of a small number. And certainly from colleagues I know who are faculty of color, there's a lot of pressure when you show up at an institution to suddenly, you know, bring all these pieces you end up getting many students of color coming to you for support, obviously, because frequently you're the first faculty member they've had who's not white, maybe even first teacher, which is horrifying to think. So there's a lot of kind of cultural energy and other calls on your time that happen and just on sort of your, your functional being. And the institution expects all sorts of things of you or asks all sorts of things that aren't being asked of, of your white colleagues as well. So I think that, you know, thinking about how, how do we support diversifying our faculty in ways that isn't giving deeply unfair loads or isn't kind of weakening everybody overall? There are opportunities. And I think that, you know, again, it would be not that anyone in my administration is hearing this podcast probably, but, you know, those are the kinds of things where, for example, you know, suddenly money comes down from on high that allows, that encourages departments to make some of those, kind, to expand the diversity of the department with new hires, that kind of thing. I think that everyone is still really nervous, partially because of our political moment and various Supreme Court cases, of really asking the question of like, what if we put aside money and said, we're going to hire people who aren't white? What would that look like? You know, how, how does that work? And what does that mean in our larger framework? And how do we do that in a way that doesn't blow back on them? I mean, I know for sure, you know, women who got hired in these big pushes would, would sort of get pushed back of, and it's like, look, th the process is broken, right? The process is broken. This is not about people being good at their jobs or not. And the way we fix it is by fixing it. We have resources, we fix it. And we have not hit that watershed yet where people are willing to do that um, to change. But I think, I think that, you know, what we'll see is that students of color will thrive in environments where they both feel supported and are reflected right. in the faculty. So, you know, I think that probably at least, you know, one of the biggest things I can do is figure out why that's not happening, you know, in our field, in our university, or celebrate it when it is happening, right? And so I think that that those are the, the pieces. So, you know, it's not that like, when I get into my classroom, I mean, you know, we all make statements and we all try to make it clear, maybe not all. Certainly, there are many good models now for putting things into your syllabus for, you know, signaling your good intentions for trying to, you know, make sure people are connected to resources. Right. And all people need to do is Google you and you see your articles and your, your right. And I mean, there's, and you know, many good, many universities now I would say have sort of various offices of inclusion and, you know, resources to make sure that students can, you know, tie into all sorts of services and communities. There's great, you know, in the sciences in particular, there's both a national society of black physicists and a uh, which is a group that that serves Latina and Native and Indigenous scientists. And those groups, we have a thriving SACNAS branch at the UW. So there's a lot of places where community is forming. And so certainly a low, low bar for us is to, you know, get those resources onto websites, mention those resources to students. But it doesn't get them into the classroom or into, you know, my classroom specifically. 
And I think one of the things that does is changing the, the bigger picture, right? What does the big picture look like and how does that change that, you know, then enables students to do the things they want to do? Do you get any pushback or feedback from your colleagues about your outspokenness, politically or socially? I mean, not a huge amount and sometimes a ton. Is it discouraged? Right. Has it discouraged me? Or no, is it, is it, it? No. Do they try to discourage you? Oh, have you yeah. Felt well, so that? I would say that the, actually the thing that I have received the most, and I, and this is, I would say, not representative. I've seen, you know, there there are many different flavors this comes in. So for me personally, the thing that I found the most was that as I was looking to transition to a faculty job, many people told me to keep my mouth shut until I got tenure. On you know, on many different levels. But basically, they were like, yes, this has all been fun and games, but, you know, you should probably just lay low until you get tenure for a variety of reasons. When do you is, get tenure? Well, we'll see if I do at all. <laughs> well, um, when would you, wh- two, when two would it years. be? This is my fourth In year. another two, two, two years. years. Okay. So, um, so life's an adventure and we'll see. Possibly part of why I feel okay being outspoken is because although I love my work a lot and I love the opportunity to do this work, uh, I would be happy doing lots of things. I, you know, I've done lots of things in my life and it is not the only part of my identity that's important. So it would be upsetting and I would, you know, shout from the rooftops and be real mad about it. So you're not being censored, but, but you're being advised. Yeah. I mean, certainly I've, I have received advice that is, that being said, you know, the chair of my department gave me a magnet yesterday. What did it say? It's amazing. It says something like, I never half asked shenanigans. <laughs> so like they knew what they were getting when they <laughs> hired me. Like I, I'm, I'm a pretty known quantity. And maybe that was part of it too, was that I felt pretty confident that if a department was going to hire me, they sort of knew what was coming. Uh, and we'll see how that goes in the end. But, but I think that I would not be able to live with myself doing it differently. And that's kind of my bar. So other than your, your kind of upbringing of social justice and being aware of other people, where does that boldness come from for you? Is it, is that part of your family f- fabric or? Uh, I don't know. I think my sister is much, much cheekier than I am. I, no, I don't. I, I mean, it's just, I, I don't want to be self-effacing, but it's nothing that's on purpose. Like this is just who I am. Sometimes I try to not be quite this much this way. Um, but this is this is just kind of who I am. And the way you've always been. We could call my mom. She's probably still around. I think she <laughs> would laugh a lot. Uh-huh. And then she would tell you that this has basically been it. It's hard to know. I mean, you know, if, if I was feeling like super psychoanalytic, you know, I've been chronically ill since I was four. So is that with your arthritis? With my arthritis. So my life certainly was shaped in a, in a weird way by... Right. Like I was in on in a wheelchair and on crutches and had all sorts of surgeries and adventures through kind of elementary school, which certainly was formative time for me. But like, I don't know, I was kind of surly as soon as I remember existing, not in a mean way, but just in a sort of out, like I was never a quiet kid. Even before the arthritis, there was no record of me being quiet. So I, I think that probably the one thing I have is that I, I have had sort of the privilege and the luxury of being in places where I am supported and that outspokenness has been rewarded and not punished. Uh, and I know that is <clears throat> certainly not something that is true for everybody. And I certainly, you know, have colleagues, especially, you know, colleagues of color who we can stand side by side and say the same things. And I sort of get cheered for my pushing the boundaries and they receive hate mail. Mm-hmm. Right. So so part part of why I say and do the things I do is because it's who I am. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, I recognize that I can take some of those risks that other colleagues cannot mm-hmm. um, I think or it, that do sometimes and, and their consequences are extremely high. And I think it's, it depends on how it comes out of your mouth, too. No, no. <laughs> I, you know, there's frequently this argument made about tone. We hear the words that come out of people's mouths differently because of how they look. And I think that that much more frequently is what it's about. So who's getting the hate mail? Oh, I, I have... Several colleagues who have received death threats for speaking out about issues across, I won't say across the board, all women, all but, women, but you're both saying, white and, and black women. But it's, you're saying that it's what, it's how you're presenting yourself or how, what you look like that, what, what makes them different or what makes you different than them? Uh, so, it, I mean, it, it both depends on the focus of their ire. So for example, we had a lot of issues around in astronomy several years ago. Jeff Marcy was a faculty member at the University of California at Berkeley. And I would say that he was kind of our 
was was kind of the the watershed moment in astronomy around sexual harassment. And, you know, around that, so that was, I was, I am less close to sort of that core community. There was a group of, of astronomers who, you know, kind of put their necks out to protect the women that were involved in that and escalate that to the place where it finally was dealt with by Berkeley. Certainly people who are closely involved with that. Jeff uh, was, I will say, is famous in kind of the, He's an exoplanet. He does like planet hunting. So he was very active in the early, which is now like a very hot topic in astronomy. And so people both inside and outside of astronomy were very protective of him. And so I would say that frequently we get the most, I have seen the most, you know, like the internet generated hate comes out of those things where like you cross into say public figures. Right, got it. Okay. Right? Where, where people feel that kind of protectiveness for lack of a better word that then generates this sort of like very virulent response but but for sure i i think that again for colleagues that are black or latino or latino it they're just the the societal pushback sort of the random hate mail to email for example is something that i see much much less of even you know i like i fundraise for abortion on my Twitter timeline, right? Like it's not, <laughs> when I joined the board for the Lilith Fund, my husband literally said to me, like, do we need to worry about people firebombing our house? And I was like, ooh, didn't occur to me. I don't think so. I don't know. Texas is a place, you know, and we didn't. That did not happen, but it was enough that it was a question, right? And so I think that there are different rules depending on on sort of, you know, what you look like. And yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I cannot objectively read the things I write on the internet, but I don't think they're usually low key. Like subtle is not on brand for me. So, I, so I'm pretty sure it's nothing to do with that. That's awesome. Is there anything, as we just kind of wrap up here, is there anything that we didn't cover that you would like to still chat about? I No, I'm good. Okay. I, I know. I Yeah. I mean, that's certainly some of the things, but... That's a lot of That's things. a lot of things. It is. As um, as we just wrap up, I always like to ask my guests, yeah. I kind of finish with the question of what does it mean to you to be bold? So I think that really all I ever ask for people is that they is that they, they do the most that they can do, which is really different for all of us. You know, we tend to compare ourselves to other people. And there's reasons why we do that. But I think that it's really important to know yourself and to you know, think about what, what is important to you and how, how are you living those values? How are you putting that out into the world? And to really push a little bit against, I think that things seem scarier than they are. Again, I think we are frequently motivated by comfort and fear. And so I think that the fear kicks in earlier than it needs to. And so thinking about where are the places that we can sort of push into our discomfort a little bit to support the world around us is really important. Mm -hmm. So that's usually asking people to sort of push into discomfort when even when they feel that sort of beginning tickle of fear is usually usually what I ask from people. You know, that reminds me of something kind of weird. But do you know that you can you can hold your breath for far longer than you ever might think you can? Yes, yeah, like so I feel there's so the thing for me, which is like my, you know, this is my embarrassing mom flag. This is like the gag reflex, right? So like babies, when babies are really little, parents always think their children are, are going to die. It's just sort of for funsies. <laughs> and when you start feeding kids food, they like get like they're very dramatic. Babies are exceedingly dramatic. And so they get food like on their tongue and they're like, I'm dying. Uh, and then you're like, oh my God, we can't give them food because they'll choke to death and die. <laughs> But biology is great. And so that kicks in super early. And so the younger they are, their gag reflex is super sensitive and like food gets near their face and they, you know, because it's very self-protective. And as you get older, your gag reflex goes down and it's easier to eat food and they're not. So because your body's like, oh, wait, we know how to swallow food. We've got this. We are masters of food. So then your body kind of adjusts to that. So I think there are a lot of things. And we actually know my daughter just sprained her ankle. We got a good lecture on pain sensitivity. We've learned all sorts of things now. Our brains always are trying to protect us. And so always throws up, you know, these like, oh, no, I think that's pain. And you're like, no, no, it's fine. Like everything, you know, so frequently injuries, it's hard to recover from injuries because there are some injuries that you have to push through a little bit of that discomfort to tell your body, like, it's okay to move your foot now. Like your foot can do this. And it's tricky because I think we live at a time when there is an overcorrection where everyone's like, 
oh, are you suffering immensely? Has your leg fallen out? Just push through it. It's like, no, don't do that either. Like there, there has to be a balance between working with that discomfort and that fear and taking care of yourself in a way that is not just like feeding into that extractive sort of leave your whole soul out. But I think we tend to overcorrect, right? I think we're kind of wired to overcorrect. And so, you know, engaging in that space and not just sort of shutting everything down and being like, nope, I have to have to lock down. This, right. You know, so sort of engaging that a little bit more curiously. Right. Just pushing through, um, yeah. you know, and so not the place where, I don't know, we were just at PT and overheard, you know, someone's like, well, you know, she was in a lot of pain, but she did it anyway. It's like, well, that's not great either. <laughs> you know, I don't want anyone calling in. It's like, well, I pushed through and now I broke both ankles. Like, yeah, don't do yeah. that. That's, that's not the moral of the tale. Yeah. So it's but, getting to know yourself. Yeah. Fi- sure. Finding, pushing those boundaries a little bit. Where can people find you? Is Twitter your main outlet is that the best place to kind of send Pro- you in probably, a public manner probably mm-hmm. twitter yeah. and then you've i mean got- i'm listed on the website people show up at my office right sometimes. yeah <laughs> don't do that it's a little disconcerting know, but yeah <laughs> i might though um so so twitter and then you've got some great medium articles mm-hmm. on medium and i'll link to those as well gosh thank you so much this was um this was much this was much more I don't want to say interesting, but it was much more broad strokes, like so much more to the conversation than I anticipated. We didn't just talk about stars and galaxies. and I mean, we can also talk yeah, so. about <laughs> There's lots to know. Galaxies are wonderful. There Come is. learn about them. I know, but um, when, my favorite. when's your next <laughs> class start? Uh, I know. So I teach started? in the fall. Oh, um, okay. intro, intro astronomy, I teach in the fall. Okay. Yeah. So every end of September, put it on your calendar. What are you doing? Yeah, I'm going to be running across the Atacama. Yeah, that's okay. I'll be there right before you. I'm, I'll be back from there. But yes. Okay. Yeah, give me a ping. Well, I I will. I'll Maybe for next year, I'll schedule it in because I don't. Hope, I knock really on wood, I'll still be to. there. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. We'll see once this comes out. Well, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I highly encourage you to check out Sarah's Twitter stream. Uh, and you don't need to sign up for Twitter to see it. She's at... N-I-A-I-S, or you can just Google Sarah Tuttle, Twitter, and maybe throw in the word astrophysicist for good measure, and her feed will come up. Maybe just reading her feed will help you to be more bold and outspoken about injustices. If you enjoyed our conversation, you might like my conversation with Kim Studerman Rogers, and that was episode number 66. Kim considers herself a citizen scientist. She studies wildlife on this planet, though. (laughs) But I think that there's some nice synergy in these conversations that you might like. You can find that and all of my other episodes at she'sboldpodcast.com slash episodes or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. I'm not sure if it will go live next week or the following. Uh, I'm working on my calendar right now for future episodes, but soon you'll hear my conversation with Laureen Nussbaum. And Laureen is a Holocaust survivor. Uh, She was a friend of Anne Frank's, and she's the author of a book that tells the story of how her family and many others were saved by one man during the Holocaust. And uh, spoiler alert, it was not Schindler. If you'd like to support the show and let me know how much you are inspired by these conversations and how much you look forward to hearing the uplifting stories from my guests, go to patreon.com slash be bold. Patreon supporters get to submit questions for me to ask guests and become part of our private Facebook group, and that is ladies only. They also get access to bonus content, including questions I ask of the guest. This week, you'll find out why Sarah calls herself a tempest well outside her teapot. To keep up with me and all of my travels and my running, you can connect with me by friending me on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram at both Beth Witwa, B-E-T-H-W-H-I-T-W-A, and Wandergal, W-A-N-D-E-R-G-A-L. Feel free to leave a message or question at 877-280-5170. I do love feedback. You can also email me at beth at she'sboldpodcast.com. And I should mention that I'm starting to get some ideas from listeners for future deep dive episodes with Chris Fagan. We're going to be recording, I think, again next week. So if you have suggestions for topics, do let me know. Ladies, you can join the Be Bold Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Be Bold group for support and encouragement for whatever ways you're trying to be bold. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the She's Bold podcast. And until next time, be bold.